Albion's museum line has relatively few offerings, all close replicas of historical swords. In order to meet the exacting demands of replicating them to a high degree of accuracy, Albion charges more for museum line swords than next generation, sometimes a lot more. Today, let's take a look at a museum line sword and see what it is you get for the increased price. Hello, this is Kyle, also known as Alien Tube, and in this review I'll be covering the Albion Museum Line Tritonia paired with the DBK Scabbard, both on loan to me from my extremely generous friend Steve. If you like this review, or any of the others featuring swords he's loaned to me, please thank him in the comments below. The Tritonia's origins stem from a commission by the Museum of Medieval Stockholm in Sweden for Peter Johnson quite possibly the premier sword researcher and smith today. The museum wanted him to create an exact replica of an existing sword they had in their collection to show what it would have looked like when in pristine condition. I haven't been able to find many pictures of the original, as it seems the museum does not have their collection available online. So here's the two pictures I found, both from Albion's website. As you can see, the original is missing a portion of its crossguard and part of the tip. Mr. Johnson, who has a strong working relationship with Albion, passed on the knowledge from studying the original and crafting the replica, allowing Albion to utilize that knowledge in their museum line entry, the Tritonia. So what that boils down to is that this sword has the bones to be one of the most faithful reproductions of a historical sword available on the production market. Let's talk about the typology of this sword. This is representative of an Oakshot Type 13B sword. There are a total of four types in the 13 category, type 13, and then subtypes A, B, and the rarer and relatively newer subtype C. The differences between these types and subtypes are minor. They all feature broad blades with very little profile taper and a fuller, sometimes multiple, that runs about half the length of the blade. The tips are rounded or spatulate, and the blades are always of lenticular cross-section. The primary differentiator of the various subtypes is the grip length. A Type 13 usually had a grip that was a little longer than normal for a one-handed sword, sometimes ranging up into hand-and-a-half territory, whereas a 13B was always one-handed. The overall Type 13 group saw its widest use from the mid-13th to later 14th centuries, and they were primarily cut-focused swords. Before getting into the sword itself, a detour to the scabbard, because it deserves some serious attention and admiration. It was made by Brian Kunz of DBK Scabbards, and I think I can safely say the least controversial thing I've said on this channel is that he's an absolute master at his craft. That mastery does come at a steep price, however. This scabbard cost roughly 3200 US dollars, almost double the price of the sword itself. So what do you get for that price tag? Simply put, you get a scabbard that's both a work of art and supremely functional. First off, the fit could not be better. The sword easily slides into and out of the scabbard, there's absolutely no rattle, and it's got the perfect amount of retention. This is made all the more impressive because Mr. Kunz did not have access to this specific sword when he made the scabbard. He utilized his own Tritonia. The designs in the scabbard are amazingly crisp, the lines are straight, and the rich blue dye job is superb. The leather is supple and clearly of very good quality, and the stitch work along the back is uniform and very well done. I'm honestly running out of superlatives to describe the scabbard, so instead I'll just show you some footage and let you admire it. Moving on to the hilt, let's start with the cross guard. It most closely resembles a Type 2 guard with a gentle flare out to a rounded rectangle at the ends of the quillins. It's got a satin finish, with the polishing line still quite visible. Personally, I would prefer to see it brought to a slightly finer finish than this. The gap, however, is excellent. 
there's very little space between the guard and the blade, as always for Albion. The pommel is representative of the relatively uncommon Type R, and it's got a nice floral cap that sets off the extremely clean peen. The finish is a little shinier than that of the cross guard, although there are still visible tool markings here. Just like the Soloski sword I reviewed recently, there's not really any way this pommel, with its spherical shape, could create hot spots, so it obviously doesn't cause any discomfort in use. I would say the grip is standard for Albion, but that implies a mundanity that would be an injustice to the craftsmanship. It's an excellent grip, with a lot of dimension to the shape, and five admirably defined risers that really help lock the sword in hand. When I hold it tightly, it's not going anywhere. I can't rotate the sword by pushing on the cross guard at all. The glued down seam does wander a bit rather than being straight, but it's not noticeable when held in hand. And now it's time to talk about the business end, the blade. As per usual, here's the measurements I took of it. I mentioned earlier that there's not a lot of profile taper in Type 13 swords, which means they need quite a lot of distal taper to keep from being too forward heavy and handling like an unrefined bar of metal. It's no surprise that Tritonia features excellent distal taper, starting at 6.2mm thick and rapidly tapering through the first 12 inches down to about 4.5mm, then gradually tapering the rest of the way, eventually ending at about 2.5mm right before the tip. This complex geometry leads to a blade that's actually quite stiff in the first two-thirds of the blade, after which it flexes well while still returning to true. Both the blade and hilt vibration nodes are exactly where they should be. You can easily see the blade node here, and the hilt node is in the grip. Perfect design. The finish on the blade is Albion's typical satin, with some tool markings visible here and there. The primary surfaces of the blade show no rippling, although the fuller does have some, which I think is a little disappointing in a sword in this price range. Those same fullers terminate in a gradual blending into the lenticular cross-section, and they end extremely close to the same spot on both sides of the blade. I think there's a little less than a millimeter difference. As you would expect from Albion, the edge geometry is superb. There's not a trace of a secondary bevel as the blade gently curves into the sharp edge. This is an excellent example of how a lenticular sword should be crafted, and the sharpness itself is standard for Albion. Sharp enough for most people's backyard cutting, but probably not keen enough to be effective against any kind of protective clothing, such as a gambeson or Akaton. So how does this sword handle, and in particular, how does it compare to the Mateusz Solowski sword it helped inspire? Alright, here is the Albion Tritonia. Just going to put it through a few swings, a little bit of tip control, see what I think of it. Got pretty good tip control actually, which is kind of surprising to me when you consider the tip weight. It's pretty hefty. not a light sword. And much like the Mateusz Solowski sword, I believe this was intended as a cavalry piece, something that you would deliver heavy strikes on horseback. Not really a dueling sword, something that you want to, you know, nimbly move around. You're more concerned with power with this. Let me uh, pick up the Mateusz Solowski sword. Feel Actually, it's surprising. They feel very similar. I think I have a bit better tip control with the Tritonia, but not a lot. It handles the way you would expect it would handle. It's not, let me put it this way, it's not like the Ronin Katana I 
uh, reviewed just uh, recently where it felt awkward to swing around and it felt like all the weight was out in the out near the tip. This feels the way it's supposed to feel, the way a sword should feel. It doesn't mean it's not heavy, it doesn't mean it's a light dueler, but it doesn't feel like a sharpened crowbar. Let me pick up the Mateusz Slawski again. This one definitely does feel, this one feels like it has a bit more heft to it. I'm not even sure what the, you know, where the point of balance is between, comparatively between the two of them. This one is definitely broader. Let me actually pick them both up and see if you... Yeah, the Soloski is definitely broader. Well, looks like they're about the same length, maybe a little bit longer, it's hard to say. The Soloski has a much more acute point. Let's see if you can see that. This is a little awkward holding two very hefty arming swords like this. You would certainly never want to try to do a wield with these two, that's for sure. But they actually, they feel surprisingly similar, which is interesting since they are, they actually have a decent amount of difference in their geometry. But, you know, the Tritonia is one of the swords that inspired this Solovsky. So it probably does make sense. I think I like the grip on the Tritonia a bit better. Not having that uh, stitched seam. I, stitched seams, uh, generally, I'm not as much of a fan as the glued seam that you'll see on Albion's. The stitching, even if it's not rough, you definitely feel it in the hand. It doesn't, it, do, it didn't give me any like discomfort or anything, but I feel it there and I'm not used to that feeling. And I think I just overall like the, the, the glued seam better. Good boy. I wouldn't want to have to pick between one of these two swords. I mean, let's be honest, let's be real. These aren't my style of sword. I am much more of a long sword person than arming sword. And if it is an arming sword I would want, I would want something a bit nimbler, a little more agile. Whereas these are, like I said, these are heavy cutting swords that are designed for cavalry use. So they're not my style of sword. But if I were going to choose between these, I wouldn't want to have to make that choice. One quick addendum. After further handling, I've decided that in addition to preferring the glued seam on the Albion's grip, I also prefer its shape. The Soloski grip felt a little large in my hand compared to the Tritonia's, which fit perfectly. All right, bottom line. The Tritonia costs 1,628 US dollars and the DBK scabbard roughly 3,200. Are they worth those prices? The quick and easy answer first. The scabbard is absolutely worth it. This is the best executed scabbard I've had the pleasure to experience, and the level of detail, fit and finish, and gorgeous craftsmanship is just outstanding. I'm currently on DBK's approximately three year wait list, and I can't wait to see what Mr. Cleanse makes for me. Now for the Tritonia. Well, at the risk of repeating myself from the Soloski review, it's not for me. This type of big, heavy cavalry sword just isn't what I'm looking for, but that doesn't mean I can't recognize and appreciate the skill that went into making it. Add in the fact that it so closely replicates an existing historical sword, and there's a lot to like about it. So yes, I think it's worth the price if this is the type of sword you want. But for me personally, if I were to spend $1,600 on an arming sword, I'd probably go with something shorter, more agile and nimble just to fit my preferences. And with that, I'm drawing this review to a close. Once again, I extend my heartfelt thanks to Steve for his generosity in loaning me such exquisite swords. And the good news is, there's more to come. But that's for another time, and until then, Alien 2 out.